Corinthians chapter 9. The title of the message is uh, Denying Self to Follow Christ. And would you pray with me one more time? Heavenly Father, we come before you again, and we thank you, Lord, for um, the wonderful time of worship that we've had. Um, Lord, we thank you for uh, the fellowship that we have with one another, Lord, um, the time of prayer. Now, Lord, we're going to get into your word where you want to communicate to us um, things from your heart. And so, Lord, I pray you'd give each of us eyes to see, ears to hear what you're saying, Lord. I pray it wouldn't be just another sermon, but truly, Lord, it'd be an encounter with you, Lord, that we'd hear from you. So open hearts now, open our hearts and our minds to receive from you, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> All right, well, in chapter 8, Paul, um, Paul was talking about Christian liberty, and he really was seeking to set the boundaries for the liberty of for the use of, Christ, of a Christian's liberty. And he warned the Corinthians in that chapter not to use the liberty, that they, the liberty that they had in the Lord in such a way as to stumble or offend uh, those weaker than themselves in the faith. And here in chapter 9, Paul then showed them how he followed the same principle in his own life um, in ministry. Look at me at verse 1. Paul said, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ, our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? So Paul opened the chapter with a series of rhetorical questions. And they were aimed really at defending his authority and also his own liberty in Jesus Christ. As he said, am I not an apostle? And am I also not free? Now the Corinthians boasted in their freedom and in their liberties. They were a very... Um, their, their culture was a lot like ours, <clears throat> Corinth. Um, it was a very self-centered culture. And, a very, and so liberty, they latched on to this idea in the gospel that I'm free, you know, free from the law, free from um, the constraints of Old Testament uh, dietary principles and, um, you know, that I am free in Christ to do as I please. As, you know, many of them um, had some newfound liberty um, and eating the meat that was sacrificed to idols. And we talked about that all last week. And so Paul here said to the, basically to those in Corinth who were boasting about their liberty, do not I as an apostle have even more reason to boast in my liberty than you? you know? And he and basically said also, where did you learn about such things as Christian liberty and freedom in Christ? As he said there at the end of verse 1, are you not my work in the Lord? Where did you guys come to this knowledge from? And then in verse 2, he said, If I am not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Now, Paul gave two verifications of his apostleship. Number one, as he said in verse 1, um, Have I not seen Jesus Christ, our Lord? Now, an apostle, in the New Testament sense, had to be an eyewitness of Christ's resurrection. You remember in the book of Acts, you remember Judas, of course, fell from the ministry. He betrayed the Lord and he hung himself. And so the apostles were seeking to replace him um, among the twelve. And Peter stood up among the apostles in those days and he said in Acts chapter 1, verse 21 to 22, he said, Therefore, of these men who have accompanied, accompanied us all the time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So it had to be someone who had followed along with them, not necessarily one of the twelve, well, because Judas was gone, but it had to be someone who followed along with them who also witnessed Christ's resurrection. That was a requirement. And so Paul met that criteria. Remember, Jesus appeared to Paul on the Damascus Road in his resurrected state. Uh, the second proof, Paul said, is you guys. You are the seal of my apostleship. The fact that a church exists in this corrupt culture is proof of my ministry, that God has called me. 
And so Paul gave him then those two verifications of his apostleship. Um, and again, Paul, as an apostle and um, with the authority of, a, of an apostle, also treasured his liberty in Jesus Christ. Um, if not more so than they and any Christian really does. Um, he understood it better than they did. But as we're going to see in this chapter, as important as Christian liberty is, there's something that's even more important, and that is serving the Lord. Um, you know, and many times in our service to the Lord, um, personal liberties must be set aside. Um, and so that's what Paul was seeking to teach the Corinthians here in chapter 9 by his own life and by his own example. All right, well, look at verse 3. Paul said, my defense to those who examine me is this. Now, interesting that Paul felt that he was being examined. And he was in Corinth. You know, there are always those in the church who feel that they have some sort of right to examine the minister. Um, and apparently Paul was no exception um, of being put under a magnifying glass. Something that happens to ministers. Um, but Paul said, my defense to those who examine me is this, if you look at verse 4 to 6, he said, Do we have no right to eat and drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife, as do also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord, and Cephas? Cephas was Peter. Or is it only Barnabas and I who have, have no right to refrain from working? So Paul, as well as Barnabas, as, he's, as Paul mentioned Barnabas here, they had every right, he said, as Christians... To eat and drink. Um, you know, they were free to do as they pleased as well. And eating and drinking here specifically probably was, was a reference to their liberty and their freedom from the um, dietary restrictions under the Old Testament law. You know, they could have a pork sandwich if they wanted to. You know, they didn't have to eat kosher anymore. You know, that, that portion of the law was, was null and void with the coming of Christ and with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And so they could choose to eat whatever they wanted, regardless. And they could also eat it even if it had been offered in a pagan ritual. Because as we looked at last week in, in verse 8 here, of, of back in chapter 8, Paul said, you know, food does not commend us to God. You know, for neither if we eat are we the better, and nor if we do not eat are we the worse. You know, there's no spiritual element to food and drink. You know, meat is just meat, and God created all things for our use. And now Paul also asserted his right here to marry. Um, a believing wife, just as, the, uh, just as the other apostles had done, and to bring her along with him in his ministry if he so chose. And also he claimed his right to receive financial support for his work in the ministry. Look at verse 7. Paul said, For wh whoever, whoever goes to war at his own expense... Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit? Or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock? So just as soldiers, farmers, and shepherds do not work for free, uh, so too a minister should not be required to work for free, but should be compensated generously for his labor. Look at verse 8 to 10. Paul said, Do I say these things as a mere man? Or does not the law say the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Is it oxen God is concerned about? Or does he say it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. So Paul cited the law of Moses. Um, and he gave a quotation from Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4, to prove that what he was saying was not just his own thoughts, it wasn't his own opinion, um, but it was in line with the teaching of Scripture. Um, as God and his law commanded the Israelites not to muzzle an ox while it was threshing and working in the field. You know, the ox was to be allowed to eat while it worked. And, of course, uh, this principle... Uh, the principle behind this command, as Paul pointed out here, went far beyond taking care of oxen. Ultimately, it applied to people, right? 
And the reasoning here applied by Paul is that if God is concerned that oxen be treated right and compensated for their work, how much more is he concerned that men be treated right and compensated for their work, especially those whom God has called to serve him in the ministry? That's the point Paul is making here. Now, in verse 11, Paul applied this principle to himself and to Barnabas. As he said there, verse 11, um, <clears throat> If we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? In other words, you know, the spiritual blessings and benefits that you have received from our ministry are of such greater value than any material thing on earth. And thus, if we've sown spiritual things for you, as Paul very well could say to them, you owe, you owe in a sense, your salvation to my ministry. Is it that big of a deal if I receive something material to be compensated for my work? And as you are my labor in the Lord, Paul said to them. You know? And so supporting ministers, missionaries, and others who faithfully serve in the gospel ministry should really go without saying. That's what Paul is saying here. Now look what he said in the first half of, chapter 12, of verse 12. Paul said, if others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? Again, the church in Corinth owed its existence to Paul's ministry. And thus, he more than any other leader or pastor they had, had the right to receive their financial support. But then he said in the second half of verse 12, look in the second half of verse 12, he said, Nevertheless, we have not used this right, but endure all things, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. So, Paul had every right to receive their support financially. But because he did not want to hinder the success of the gospel in the church and in the city of Corinth, that was still young, it was still unestablished, and um, still had many newer converts in it, who, most of whom were Gentiles and did not understand um, the, the scriptural principle of giving to the work of the Lord, lest he give them the wrong idea and lest they think that Paul was in it for the money, he waived his right to receive their support. And he worked for the church free of charge. He said, I haven't used this right. You know? Now, why is Paul talking about this? Again, the subject is Christian liberty, right? Our rights. To, and Paul is showing them here, sometimes rights for the sake of the Lord of the gospel and for the sake of our witness have to be set aside. Has to be. Paul served them free of charge. You know, and this was something that Paul often did in his ministry. In the book of Acts chapter 20, uh, Paul in his farewell address to the elders of the church in Ephesus that he had started and that he had established, listen to what he said. He said, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And so there in Ephesus, again, Paul laid aside his right to receive legitimate financial support for his ministry. And again, he did it because he did not want to hinder the gospel of Christ. Because Corinth was a newer church. Um, and it was started in an area where the gospel and the scriptures were foreign. And so Paul, in order to set the example for this young church and for the young leadership that was taking over the church, he set aside his right to receive their support. He said, I worked with my own hands. You know, Paul was a tent maker by trade. He worked with his own hands. He supported himself. He even supported those who were with him while he ministered there in Ephesus to show them what a Christian and what a minister is supposed to look like. Not someone who's on the take, right? But someone who's there to give and to share the word of God with others. If need be, free of charge. You know? And you know, that's really, I think, a great test of someone's calling. You know? Can you serve the Lord when there's nothing in it for you? you know? 
that's a great test of a person's calling. You know, my dad's a great example of this. I'm going to brag on you, Dad. You know, when my dad was first called to the ministry, you know, he, he, and, he and my mom sacrificed a lot to go through seminary. There was no financial compensation. They worked. He worked hard. You know? And for years, there was no promise of any kind of real salary. But God did provide that. But, but, there, but you see, he did it because he was called. You know? Myself, I went through Bible college. For three years, I worked as a janitor for a school district. Um, 11 years in a dental office. And in all that time, no sermon that I preached, no Bible study I led, no service that I did, and I did a lot of things, and I'm not bragging, but I'm just pointing out, I didn't receive much of anything for it by way of finance, finances or material. But why did I do it? Because my heart was in it, because God called me to it. And you know what? I, what whoever I was asked to preach, I was going to be in that pulpit. Because God called me. You see, that's the test of a calling, though. Now, Paul's not saying that receiving financial support is wrong for ministers. Actually, he's pointed out that it's right, it's just, and it's God's will. But there are times when it is to be set aside. And I do believe it's the test of a person's calling. You know, There are a lot of charlatans out there today who are in it just for the money. And they're being paid very well. And really, they're a disgrace to the gospel. And it's sad. And they're giving people the wrong idea about what the gospel is really all about and who Jesus is. You know, look at Jesus. Jesus said, foxes have holes, birds of the air, they have nests. He said, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He worked free of charge. He was supported, you know, by the generosity of, of the women that followed him throughout his ministry. You know, Jesus um, lived off of the, really the charity of others. And I think, believe Jesus, of course, more than any set the example for us all of what a Christian and a minister should be like. And so Paul, following Christ's footsteps, said, I didn't use this right, though I could have. I worked for your charge, and he did it in many occasions um, in order to be a good witness for Christ and for the sake of the gospel. Now, now, did Paul always lay aside his right to receive financial support? No. There were a number of churches from which Paul did receive financial support, uh, when he ministered among them, and um, that also supported him in his missionary um, endeavors. But again, when it came into go, when it came to going into a new territory or into new, newer churches that still needed to be established in biblical truth, Paul waived his right to receive their support. And again, he did it for the sake of the gospel. And so Paul is here um, speaking to these Corinthians again, who were pretty self-centered. And were more focused, it seemed like, than anything else on holding on to their liberties and freedoms. He was seeking to show them by example that the most important thing in the Christian life, again, it's not the use of one's liberty, but it's one's service to the Lord. That at many times requires the laying aside of legitimate rights. You know, Sometimes we have to do that. But you know, not, not when you set aside a right... Though you might not be compensated materially, the spiritual benefits far outweigh the material, I'll tell you what. And God has a way of rewarding his servants. You know, he has a way of doing that. And I've watched that in my life, too, so many times. Um, <clears throat> now, um, though Paul did lay aside his legitimate right to receive financial support from them and from others, um, still he made it clear again here in verse 13 and 14 uh, that this was the exception, not the rule, okay? The rule and the norm for the church is to, is to support those who minister to them financially. Look at verse 13 and 14. Paul said, Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the, of the temple? And those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar. Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. And so again, Paul used the Old Testament uh, to illustrate the truth that those who are called to preach the gospel should live from the gospel. Um, just as the priests and the Levites under the Old Covenant uh, were given a portion of the people's offerings to live off of, so ministers should receive their due from the offerings 
of the people. But again, look at verse 15. Paul said, but I have used none of these things, nor have I written these things, that it should be done so to me. For it would be better for me to die than that anyone should make my boasting void. Paul's boast was his ministry, his service to the Lord. He said, he said in 2 Corinthians, this is our boasting, that we conducted ourselves in the world with simplicity and with godly sincerity. He said, we have renounced the hidden things of darkness. We commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Paul would rather die than be charged with being a prophet for hire or being in it for the money. You know, that was not his heart. That was not what he was in this for. Look at verse 16. He said, for if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. That's the language of someone who is called to the ministry. Paul said, necessity is laid upon me. Woe is me. Woe means impending pain. Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. You know, Paul was in the ministry again for one reason. God called him to it. And that's the only reason anyone should ever enter the ministry. You know, I think it was Charles Spurgeon. He was an old Baptist minister from the 1800s. He said concerning the gospel ministry, if you can do anything else, do it. <laughs> if you have a way out, take it. Because it's no easy calling and it's no easy road. Um, you know, it's, it's one of the hardest things in the world to do, I can tell you from personal experience, to stand in this pulpit week after week and preach God's word. And, you know, so many people um, have no idea about the battle that pastors face. The, but the battle is mental, I can tell you. It's a mental game you go through every week, you know. And, and it, it almost starts immediately when you step out of it. You, you go through a mental battle. And, you know, no one, should, no one can do it who's not called to it. It's not possible. You won't last, you know. And there have been many who've tried to run away from that call. You remember Moses? <laughs> when God called Moses, Moses said, Lord, please send somebody else. You know, I don't want to do this. <laughs> I'm happy here in the desert. I'll just keep being a shepherd. It's all, it's fine. I don't need, my life doesn't need to be disturbed. I can't speak anyway, Lord. I'm, I'm not eloquent in my speech. I stutter. So you send somebody else. The Lord said, no, you're going, Moses. And Moses went. You remember Jeremiah the prophet? Jeremiah, at one point in his ministry, he tried to stop preaching. He said this, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. But then he had to confess this, but his word was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. That's the language of the called. It's necessity, Paul said, is laid upon me, and woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. And Paul said, if I preach the gospel, I don't have anything to boast about. Why? I'm just doing my job. <laughs> I'm just doing what God called me to do. Um, and it, as you know, it's God's call alone that puts someone into the ministry. Now, verse 17, Paul said, for if I do this willingly, speaking of his ministry, I have a reward. But if I, but if against my will, I have been entrusted with a stewardship. Now, Paul joyfully and will, willingly answered God's call to follow and serve Jesus Christ. In fact, in the book of Philippians chapter 3 that my dad quoted earlier, Paul said this, he said, What things were gained to me, uh, speaking of his former life apart from Christ, he said, These I have counted loss for Christ. And then he went on to say, Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and listen to this, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. And so Paul wasn't saying here that he wasn't willing to serve the Lord. But really what he was saying is that his being willing or not really played no part in the call of God upon his life. You know, God's call was based solely on his own free and sovereign choice, which neither Paul nor anybody could ever deserve or merit. 
Remember what Paul was going to do when he was called? He was on his way to persecute Christians. Paul wasn't, Paul wasn't a willing vessel, but he was called, and that's what changed everything. The call of God, the power of God to change a person's life, to turn them from a persecutor into a preacher. Paul was a personal example. And Paul recognized that with that call, he was a steward. He received a stewardship. Now, what is, what's the job of a steward? Well, a steward's one job, really, is just to be faithful with what's been entrusted to him. Now, Paul said, if I do this willingly, if I serve the Lord with a willing heart, and if I make the most of my stewardship, then I have a reward. But, but if not, it makes no difference because I'm still entrusted with a stewardship for which God will hold me accountable. And my being unwilling does not change the purpose of God concerning me. There's no getting out of it, basically. It's like Moses tried, you know. Now, I suppose if I wanted to, I could be stubborn about it. And I could try to hold out. But you know, God has a way of making the unwilling willing. <laughs> you remember a guy by the name of Jonah? Yeah. Remember what happened to Jonah? Jonah learned by experience how painful running from God's call can be. Um, and so, whether I'm willing or not, I still have a stewardship. And I'm going to be, God's going to hold me to account for what he's given me to do. Verse 18, Paul said, what is my reward then? That when I preach the gospel, I may, pre I may present the gospel of Christ without charge, that I may not abuse my authority in the gospel. So Paul chose to preach the gospel on many occasions free of charge though he had every right to receive compensation, as he's already proved from the Old Testament law. And Paul did this willingly with great happiness and joy. And you know, Paul looked upon this as his own personal contribution and offering to the Lord. You know, that's how Paul viewed. He didn't do this begrudgingly. He didn't do it unwillingly. He didn't do it with bitterness in his heart. Oh gosh, I gotta go preach to these people again. You know, They're not gonna pay me anything, you know. <laughs> You know? uh, and you know, really, that is the way all of us sh should be when it comes to serving the Lord. Whatever we're asked to sacrifice um, in the call of God upon our lives. And you know, I, although I've been focusing a lot on ministers, you know, God has a call in every Christian's life. God has a, has a purpose for each and every child of God, and he's got a plan for us to fulfill. He's, he's called us all to be witnesses of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection to, to those around us. And so... Whatever sacrifice we might be asked to make in our witness for Christ, listen, we should do joyfully. You know, the Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. And you know, there's nothing worse than a Christian who gives begrudgingly of him or herself to the Lord. You know, none of us like it when someone gives or helps us out begrudgingly. Do you like that? Someone helps you, but then they make it known the whole time how, you know, how you're putting them out and, and how, you know, oh, I guess I'm going to do this for you, but oh, man, that's, that's going to cost, you know, that's going to cost me my, you know, my week's pay and, you know, okay, but, you know, I mean, you know, if, if, that's, if that's the way someone helps you out, personally, I would rather they just not help me. It's not worth it, you know, and, you know, it's the same, God feels the same way. God feels the same way. If you can't give to him cheerfully, and maybe you shouldn't do it at all, you know, you know. And, you know, it's important that we understand that God really is indebted to no man. God doesn't owe me and he doesn't owe you anything, but rather he chooses freely to give of himself to us. And, you know, he would have it be the same of us to him. You know, in the Old Testament, the Lord commanded them to bring their free will offering. That, and, you know, that's how we should view whatever we give to the Lord, whether it be a tithe, an offering, um, ourselves, our time, um, our, our, just our devotional life, our prayer, our sacrifices we make for other people, you know. We need to view it through the lens. You know, the Bible says, whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. Um, when you view it in that way, it makes it actually a lot easier, <laughs> you know. Sometimes you're asked to do things for people that aren't the easiest to do it for. If you're focused on them, it's going to be really hard. But if you focus them, you know what? I'm doing this as unto Jesus. 
it makes it a lot easier. Because you know what, Lord, I can do that for you. I can do that for you. I can do it as unto you. And so this is how God would have us to serve him. And, no, and you know, when you consider how much God has done and given to us through his son, how could we not offer our lives back to him? You know, we're going to celebrate this morning at the communion table his broken body, his shed blood for our salvation. And this was Paul's attitude and even his boast. Um, as he said, he counted all things loss for Christ and thus he spared no expense and he counted nothing too dear to part with in his service for the Lord. As look at what he said here in verse 19 to 23. Paul said, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, not being without law toward God, so he clarifies himself what he meant here, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. What a confession. You know? Paul said, though I am free from all men, though I have liberty in Jesus Christ to do as I please, yet for the sake of the gospel, he often set that liberty aside in order to win as many as he could for Jesus Christ. And he, he said that he became a servant to all, putting the interests of others before himself. You know, that's what it means to follow Christ. Putting the interests of others before me. Oh, how I fail in that so often. But that's, that's the example set for us here by the Apostle Paul and ultimately by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And you know, let me tell you this. This is a key ingredient to a successful gospel ministry and witness for the Lord. You know, if I can't set aside my rights, how can I reach anybody, really? You know, and the trouble with the Corinthians was that all they were focused on was themselves, their liberties, their rights. They weren't willing to make any personal sacrifices. And you know, when that's the case, uh, a Christian is of very little use to the Lord. You know, he, John MacArthur said, holding tightly to liberties and rights is a sure way to lose the race of soul winning. Many of the Corinthian Christians seriously, seriously limited their testimony because they would not limit their liberty. They refused to give up their rights, and in so doing, they won few and offended You know, I confess, I think I've offended people many times in my witness for the Lord. And you know, we can, we can be arrogant. Um, we're all guilty of it. And we can be arrogant to, towards unbelievers. And we can look at all the things that are wrong with the world and with the culture and all the rest, which is all true. But if that's all we are, how could we ever really reach them or win them? You know, you know they, they have to see Christ in us. And if it's all about me, and if it's all about how upset I am about the way things are going in the world, then I'm still holding on to my rights. You know? You know, Jesus, think of, think of, he was Lord of glory, of all eternity. The world, a fallen sinful world, filled with depravity. Did he hold on to his right as God? Paul said no. He set aside he laid aside his, his prerogatives as God and became a man. And even more than that, he became a servant of all. You know, I think, I think so much of what passes for a Christian today just doesn't pass the test of Jesus, you know. Jesus is the test. Don't forget it. And Paul here is really 
laying the foundation for what a true ministry looks like. I've become all things to all men. Now, this is not something we can do on our own, granted. Um, by nature, we're all selfish, and we're all, we all want it our way, you know. Um, and I'm just as disgusted at what I see going on in the culture today as anyone else. But we have to ask ourselves, what's the end game? What are we seeking to do, you know? Do we want to reach people? Do we want to see people in this church? Do we want to see people get saved? Well, then, you know what? It's going to require sacrifice on my part. It's going to require, require a self-sacrifice. It's going to require a humbling of myself. And it's going to require me laying down some rights to help somebody else out. You know? And that's what Paul is saying here that he did. But you know, Paul did it with joy. Paul did it with joy. He said he did it willingly. And you know why he was able to do that? Because he knew the Lord. When you know Jesus, you can do it. You can't do it in and of yourself. But you can do it when you're abiding in him. He said, I'm the true vine. He said, if you abide in me and I in you, what's going to happen? You're going to bring forth much fruit. Paul told us what the fruit of the Spirit is in Galatians chapter 5. He said, it's love, it's joy, it's peace, it's patience, it's kindness, it's goodness, it's meekness, it's gentleness, self-control. That's the fruit of the Spirit. That's the work of God's Spirit in my life. Love, joy, peace. That's the life of Christ in me. But in order for that life to be manifested in me, you've got to get me out of the way. I got to get broken. I got to lay down some rights. I got to pick up my cross, as Jesus said, deny myself and what? Follow him. And that's what Paul here said that he did. And he did it, he did it for all men in order that he might save it and win as many as he could. Now, Paul closed the chapter with a call to uh, these kind of self-centered Christians to start getting into better spiritual shape. And he used a couple of... Uh, um, metaphors here. Look at verse 24 and 25. Paul said, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it or win. Verse 25, And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. So Paul likened the Christian life and witness to that of running a race. And in a race, Paul said, only one receives the prize. And so Paul basically is saying this to them. Start running your races. Start living your Christian lives with the same discipline and with the same intensity of a runner who is seeking to win a race. Now what does a runner do who seeks to win a race. Paul said he's temperate in all things. And Paul said they're competing for perishable crowns. You know? And if someone competing for a perishable crown, whether it be in the Olympics or other sporting events, is willing to discipline themselves and go through such extreme physical training as is necessary just to compete, then how much more should believers in Jesus Christ be willing to discipline themselves, spiritually speaking? And sacrifice whatever is necessary in this life in order to obtain an imperishable crown that is never going to fade away. You know, we should follow the example of the athletes, you know, spiritually speaking. Look at what they do. They discipline themselves, you know. When, you know, when, when they want to eat, they don't. When they want to sleep, they're out running, you know. They, they, dis, they go against their natural feelings and desires. Why? Because they're seeking the prize. You know what? If you want the prize, you got to pay the price. Too many people today want a Christianity with no sacrifice, no personal cost whatsoever. But you know, Jesus didn't offer that kind of a Christianity. Jesus said, whoever comes to me, must deny themselves, must pick up them to their cross, must say no to the flesh and follow me. 
And if people in this earth are doing it for perishable things, how much more should we do it for eternal things, eternal rewards? You know. Now, Paul, Paul ended, his own per, Paul ended uh, in verse 26 and 27 with his own personal example once again. Verse 26, Paul said, Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. So Paul was not aimless in his spiritual disciplines, nor was he fighting as one that beat, who beats the air like a shadow boxer just pretending. Paul said, I'm not pretending. I'm not playing games. He said, but I, I take hold of myself here. He said, I'm bringing my, even my body into subjection. I'm not letting my body rule me. I'm ruling it by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you know, if you have the Spirit of God living within you, you can do that. You can say no to your body drives. Your body doesn't have to rule over you. Paul said, I make my body my slave. Why did he do this? Again, imperishable crown. And you know, he preached to others. And thus, he didn't want to end up disqualified himself. You know, those who are in the ministry are held to an even higher standard. And so, Paul said, I bring my body into subjection. Paul was determined not to be ruled again by his body or any of his sinful desires in order that he might run his race as a minister and a witness for Christ to win. How are you running your race of following Jesus? Let me ask you that. Are you just doing it with uncertainty? A eh, little here, a little there. If I got a little time, maybe you know, I'll read a Bible verse on the Bible app. or you know. But mo- is most of your time and attention given to other things, the things of the world? to your own personal likings and whatnot. You know, how are you running? Or how are you fighting? Are you, just like, are you just like a little kid, just punching, you know, beating the air, pretending you're in the ring with Mike Tyson or something like that? Or are you really fighting this fight? Are you really advancing? Are you making any progress in your relationship with Christ? Paul said, I'm going to run to win. And that's the challenge I want to leave before you this morning. Run your race to win. If you're not in good spiritual shape, it's time to turn on that Rocky music, you know. <laughs> you guys know, if you've seen Rocky, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Get up in the morning and start cracking your eggs. No, just kidding. You know. <clears throat> but it's time to start getting yourself in shape, spiritually speaking. Start disciplining yourself. Start reading your Bible. Start off the day reading your Bible. Start off the day in prayer. Start listening to worship music instead of secular music. Start setting your mind on the right things. Start putting your attention toward the goal. What's the goal? An imperishable crown. And as you listen, the Bible promises, if you will draw near to the Lord, guess what? He will draw near to you. You know, maybe some of you have been away from the Lord. You've been drifting from the Lord. And it's time to get back right with him. And it's time for you to start running your race to win. Amen? And you know, no better time to make this rededication of yourself to the Lord than at the communion table. And that's what we're about um, to partake of. And so Amy, if you'll come up. Um, You know, Jesus died to grant us forgiveness, of course, of our sins, to bring us into a right relationship to God. But It was also meant that we would walk in that right relationship towards God. And not just every now and then, not just casually, but on a daily basis. He purchased all this for us. He purchased not only our justification, which justification means just being made right with God, but he also purchased for us something else. It's called sanctification. And what that word means is to be set apart. God wants your life to be set apart for him. All these, and then ultimately, our glorification when we'll be with him in glory, completely freed from this body of sin and corruption, just receiving a new body just like Christ's. And so Jesus purchased all these things for us. But you know what? We're involved in this. You know, we don't just sit there and do nothing. 
Now justification is taken care of if you've believed in Jesus Christ. If you put your faith in Christ, all your sins are forgiven. Once and for all, he paid for them on the cross. But justification is just the start. Justification opens the door for a whole entire life of consecration to God and his will. And so that's what I'm challenging you to this morning. And as you partake of the elements, and as we remember his great love for us, let me encourage you, as he gave freely to you, may you give of yourself freely back to him. Amen.